successful prevention doesn't get anybody re-elected. I mean, you know, because it didn't happen. How can you prove that something didn't happen? You would get blamed if it went wrong, but you don't necessarily get credit if, you know, something that you think might happen doesn't happen. My name is Karen Smith. I teach at the LSC in International uh, Relations Department. I primarily research uh, European international relations and fundamentally the international relations of the European uh, Union. Now what has interested me over time is that the European Union has repeatedly declared commitments to promoting human rights in other countries and to strengthening the international human rights regime. It has also declared quite loudly its support for something that the UN calls the responsibility to protect principle. That is that the international community has a responsibility to help countries protect populations from four terrible crimes, genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and ethnic cleansing. So in my research, I'm interested in exploring the extent to which the European Union acts as a, almost as a single actor within the UN, voicing its support for what can be done at the UN level to strengthen uh, protection of human rights worldwide. Is the EU an effective diplomatic actor at the international level, and is it therefore able to help protect human rights in other countries? Genocide is one of the most extreme violations of human rights out there. And so, uh, in addition to the work that I've done on the EU at the UN, I've also then explored how European governments respond to potential or ongoing uh, genocides. Basically, in 1946, it was invented by Raphael Lemkin, um, who was a Polish Jewish refugee in the United States. He invented the term, and it, he, the term that he invented was much more expansive than the way that the term is defined in the International Convention on Genocide, which is therefore impacted on how governments uh, view it. The problem is that genocide has become a legal term, and so that the process of identifying a genocide has become a legal one that is decided in courts of law. Using the term genocide has, uh, has a particular impact, because when we say there's a genocide somewhere, we expect governments to act. There's a kind of social pressure to do that. If, uh, if you can establish that what is happening is not genocide, therefore it's possibly not as serious. And there's something that happens then that you don't need to respond with such alacrity to just crimes against humanity. And so uh, I explore the extent to which they try to avoid using the term genocide in the first place. There is a lot of research out there on, on what causes mass atrocities or what happens in a society that eventually does lead uh, to, to the perpetration of mass atrocities. Academics are learning much more about certain kinds of processes that lead to human rights violations. Now, the world isn't perfect. Governments won't always listen. But, but that leads me to think that if you do know more or less what can lead to that, and we have examples in the past in which there have been interventions, I don't, just, I don't mean only military interventions, I mean diplomatic and, uh, interventions and interventions using aid or sanctions or other economic measures that can actually uh, prevent or stop situations from deteriorating into mass atrocities. So if we know this, then we can help design policies that try to avoid those triggers or that try to help societies overcome the kinds of divisions that can eventually lead to mass, the perpetration of mass atrocities. So we put this um, uh, report together to make recommendations to the European Union on how it could strengthen uh, its uh, capacity to prevent mass atrocities. The EU has huge resources, so the potential then uh, for the EU to be able to make a difference, to have policies that could help avoid violence um, that leads to, to mass atrocities is quite uh, uh, large. So, for example, the EU sends election monitoring missions uh, to countries around the world when there's the, there are elections. 
We've known that there has been intercommunal violence after elections have been held in several countries. One of the things that the European Union could do is to think about how it might do election monitoring in such a way that it helps to avoid post-election violence and perhaps then the perpetration of mass atrocities. This was an opportunity to engage with policymakers to see what the limitations that they face are uh, and to think about how those limitations could be overcome. Part of, part of what drives me is that policy can be better. I mean, we can do these things better. If I can help contribute to making better policy that might allow governments to live up to the commitments that they have made in terms of the responsibility to, to protect populations from uh, genocide, mass atrocities, gross human rights violations, uh, then I think, I guess I think I have a duty, a public duty to do that.